Good evening, everyone, and welcome here. We'll start our set of conferences with Giulio Iacchetti on industrial design. So we really thank Giulio Iacchetti for being here. Giulio Iacchetti is one of the designers with capital D, one of the absolute protagonists of uh, uh, design in Italy. He started working in 1992 to give a precise date. Uh, so I studied the story of Iacchetti. So. Uh, one thing I love of Giulio Iacchetti that we will also appreciate is that he's going through the profession of designer uh, making different types of objects uh, throughout his career. So looking at his career, uh, there is this uh, nice thing of seeing a design that uh, tests itself uh, uh, with uh, uh, different products and different types uh, of design objects. Uh, Julian Kelly was also one of the first ones uh, in dealing with uh, what we define today as food design. So biscuits, uh, we're going to talk about that later on, so food in general. Uh, I think some one of you must have uh, had an ice cream, a famous ice cream shop in Milan, and maybe you don't even know that the spoon, the little spoon with which you um, it was this ice cream it was designed by Iacchetti. So he's a, an enthusiast of design, first of all. He's been a design enthusiast for many years, huh? and uh, he's been dealing with uh, more editorial uh, um, projects uh, like books and exhibitions. Uh, the last one presented uh, in the Triennale di Milano. So he's going to talk about this project later on. This is uh, a show that uh, he's very sensitive and concerned uh, to these field of design and uh, uh, as a curator also. So the title he chose for uh, this project is Design Between Design and Self-Production because Giulio Iacchetti, from the very beginning, sir, has been interested in this aspect of design in particular. The latest project uh, he was our director of, uh, so he will talk about this project uh, during this uh, session. And uh, uh, this is a very important aspect uh, uh, related to his uh, work uh, in the last few years, uh, related to design and uh, handicraft, uh, craftsmanship. So I think this is pretty much it. I'll give the speech to Giulio, and uh, in case you have any questions, uh, or things you want to ask or clarify, uh, there will be time for that later. All right, good evening everyone. I'm really uh, grateful for you being here. I'm very happy to be here with you. I want to thank, uh, first of all, the person who will help me translate my speech so that everyone uh, will understand me. So this is uh, an essential uh, role. And I'm very happy that... Sorry, I can't hear anything. <laughs> Okay, uh, so I thank everyone for being here and the people who brought me here. I would like to tell you about my work huh? and my experience because my work uh, is really uh, the essential aspect of my life, it's the center of my life. So uh, I really love my job. It's not uh, always like that actually for everyone. So I want to talk to you about my obsessions. Uh, obsession, by definition, is an aspect of human mind that is not always a pleasant one. If you're obsessed with something, you're kind of uh, uh, fond of something and you can't stop thinking of that. But as a designer, I think obsession is a very important tool. It's the first step to start designing and planning and to never be satisfied with what we do. So um, obsession in terms of design is the winning kind for every one of us. So I stopped going to the psychiatrist for my satisfaction, for my pleasure, and I started being a designer. So I started 
as a designer, uh, it was by chance, actually. I don't have any design background, any specific backgrounds. So I uh, studied the different subjects uh, other than design, but then I came to the decision of starting designing objects. Uh, thinking, first of all, of me and then of people. So as I was saying, I want to tell you a little bit uh, about my work, starting from the six obsessions. So to start with, the first obsession is with module. I'm obsessed with module, that is a wonderful design theme, design focus. So modules are not only applied to artificial and industrial world, but also to the natural world, the animal world. So, for example, a bee, a honeycomb, a bee. Uh, as you know very well, bees uh, create these hexagonal cells, these hexagonal cases, uh, which perfectly match and uh, perfectly create a texture. So this is a very interesting texture. So building a module means designing one object uh, that multiplied uh, becomes uh, a complete texture, and this is wonderful. I think you already experienced that uh, the, the mm, toy of Lego. It's not just a toy, a kid's toy. It's uh, a tool that allows you to build your world by matching these small pieces. I've also worked uh, with the modules uh, a lot. So designing modules uh, means thinking very small, but thinking big at the same time, thinking of the world. These are for convenience lamps. Uh, and this image allows you to understand that you can build a number of lamps uh, with this simple element. These lamps were built with some iron circles, with a circular shape as you can see. So there's a rotation axis, and then you can build lamps by adding up these plastic elements, uh, like a double hoop. And you can build a lamp in this way. So the module is not just one side, one formal aspect of this object. So this project uh, required uh, achieving several goals. So the first one was uh, so Foscarini uh, was uh, established in Murano, a small island near Venice, where uh, there has always been a tradition of uh, glass elements, glass objects uh, making. So we wanted to design a lamp to uh, remind of the Murano glasses. So if you see maybe in old houses and buildings uh, in Milan or other city, you will see uh, this uh, lattice with the small glass pieces. So we wanted to remind of this tradition. But there are also other aspects uh, in the industrial project. This lamp, for example, the diameter is uh, 60 centimeters. There's a problem of, uh, how can I say, packaging and moving the object uh, to another place, so shipment. This lamp, this is it's this big and it just occupies uh, 20 centimeters of space. You can disassemble uh, the pieces of the lamp uh, and reassemble them at home. This is a project uh, using another module. This is a bookcase uh, uh, dedicated to children produced by Magis. Uh, in my opinion, this is a very interesting theme because the modularity of the object is in this element. So here, as you can see, that include both the horizontal and the vertical levels and allow to assemble just like Lego pieces uh, to create a bookcase. An infinite, possibly an infinite uh, set of levels. This is another module. The inspiration here is to that, to the honeycomb. And this is a star-shaped element with these uh, end tips uh, and hooks uh, that allows you to create very soft um, and elastic uh, walls. You can buy 100 or 1,000 of these modules uh, and create huge walls or small walls so that can develop over time. This is a very interesting aspect using modules uh, because you can create loyal um, customers uh, that buy these objects uh, that are called a jiggle. When I design, it's not important for me the 3D dimension and the two-dimensional uh, aspect. So, 
when I had to design a shirt for uh, Salone del Mobile for Nike, I thought of the uh, pied de pool graphic, uh, this pattern uh, that comes from weaving. It's a weaving technique. So since this shirt was dedicated to a race of designers, if you come closer and look at it from a closer perspective, you can see that it's made of many uh, men's, small men's uh, rough running. So it looks like a classic texture, a classic pattern, but if you see it from closer, uh, this is a message of designer uh, participating in that race, in that run. Another modular project is this bottle handle for Alessi. The complexity of finding a solution to join up these elements uh, together and assemble them to build a huge wall. And this is a very fine work with the LSE technicians that allowed us to build this structure that can be developed and uh, duplicated uh, in an infinite uh, range of time. So you just assemble the pieces uh, on top of the lower levels uh, and in a timeless, an endless, uh, uh, an endless uh, uh, system. So in Alessi, actually, this system was working, but when it's loaded with bottles, uh, it's kind of hard to hold them. So we tried to uh, set a length of 60 centimeters, and loading it with the bottles, actually the structure gets more rigid. So we achieved uh, an unexpected goal that was a really interesting goal that we achieved. Let's now move to the second obsession I have, the obsession with the archetype. This is a very Italian obsession. So recognizing some natural shapes uh, that no one has uh, drawn uh, before. Sometimes we refer to anonymous design or natural shapes, uh, design shapes. Sometimes we also refer to things that have always happened. I'll give you an example of that. If you ask a kid, maybe I can ask my child uh, to draw uh, a house, I think all children in the world would just do this. We just draw, that is the symbol of the house, isn't it? So, and why is that? Because children are able to express very concisely very complex concepts that take a long time to be explained. But it's natural, it's automatic for children. So this shape is an archetype of a house. I'm very interested in these archetypes because they tell everything. They're very simple and straightforward. There are other shapes, like the drop shape. No one drew drew the drop shape. But if we want to refer to a shape like that, we will immediately say, oh, it's a drop shape. That's, that comes from nature. Or maybe the bottle, the shape of the bottle, that is amazing. It was designed in that way because it was linked to the blowing of glass. So it's an archetype as well, just like the gold piece that you see on the bottom left-hand side. There are many shapes like these. I just selected four archetypes and I'm going to tell you about some of my products that are based on these archetypic um, bases. So this is a shower bulb and it directly refers to the shape of a drop. So there was a company that asked me to design this shower piece in a silicone rubber. So a material that also allowed to make something very uh, brave, to do something very brave, because it's a very elastic and soft material that can be detached from the mold in an unexpected way. So if compared to other rigid objects. So we wanted to test the material and uh, show that we are very good at doing that. So this is the first object, sorry. And how does it work? Basically, um, it's a soft material, as we said, and uh, it's very simply applied to the iron structure. But we achieved another goal, and uh, actually nature helped us do that. So the first time we tried these uh, sample, we realized that the pressure of water was increasing because, uh, to tell the truth, actually this was an unexpected outcome of uh, this product because if we look at the section of the object where the water enters uh, into this object, uh, into this bulb, it expands it since it's an elastic material and increases its pressure. So it's a very positive aspect uh, for some uh, appliances and some uh, 
houses, uh, actually it works very, very well and it's very innovative. This is another archetype. So they asked me here to make a, a basin, so a sink. And uh, there are many designers that when, for example, drawing a uh, designing car, so they don't really think of uh, the objective, uh, just like Munari says, so asking ourselves about the object and the object's objective. So they do this and this when designing, the, they say, okay, I will make it longer, I will make this line longer. So they don't really ask themselves uh, who is going to drive this car, who's going to use this car. This is wrong, this is a wrong approach. So we need to start from the shapes of objects uh, and where to start from to design objects and what's the purpose of that object. So if you have to draw to design a basin, uh, there are many different shapes uh, for these objects. Uh, they, have, they can be swan shaped uh, or with this shape uh, or with that shape. So every shape uh, can be affected. But I just wanted to find a meaning behind that. So I asked myself, what is the shape of water? Actually, water has no shape. It's shapeless. It just uh, acquires the shape of the object in which it is included. So the perfect uh, object for water is the bottle, because the bottle suggests immediately the idea of water. So I just thought of designing this object, and it perfectly works, uh, because the joystick is the neck of the bottle, and it immediately tells uh, the function that this object has. This is very simple as well. It's not so widespread in the world, but you can find it uh, in Italy. It's a, a small ceramic object that is put on radiators, uh, on heaters, uh, to add humidity, to add wet to air. So I used the archetype shape of a factory, and then this was uh, the factory, the steam factory. That was the name of the object. So, about a year ago, with a surfer, a friend of mine, we started designing surfer um, tables. So where is the archetype here? The archetype here is the shape of animals. So the great uh, marine and sea animals uh, of the sea. They slip into the water in a wonderful way. So with this friend of mine, we decided to draw inspiration from the shapes of huge animals. Uh, of the sea, and they also perfectly work. The archetype of the dolphin, or the shark, of the whale. This is me in the Namibia. So, the world of art in general and the world of design has always uh, inspiration from uh, biological shapes. Uh, uh, and organic shapes. So, so finding the synthesis for a small bird, for example, this is something I'm really uh, fond of and passionate of. So the zoomorph shapes, animal shapes, are a continuing, a continuous inspiration, source of inspiration for my work. So it's very nice to, I'm not actually very good at drawing a bird because it's actually very complex uh, to make it, uh, uh, yeah, it's got, uh, this little hair on top, yeah. So this is one thing. But this drawing is the starting point. Uh, but what is the final point, the arrival point? I want to arrive to the archetype. But what is an archetype? It's uh, uh, using the less, the least objects possible to express a concept. Uh, so uh, it's amazing because uh, you can uh, express a very complex com concepts by using very simple objects. So this is my journey, because the project is a journey actually. You start with many luggage, many bags, but uh, over time you soon realize that you don't need all of this stuff. And you get to the final step, uh, uh, removing a lot of things and adding nothing else. And then you understand that the project has to stop. So you first draw and design a shape like that, uh, for example, like that, you've got one curve, two curves, three curves, four, five, six curves. So let's uh, try and design it with less curves. So one right line, one straight line, one curve, one straight line, one curve. That's perfect. So this is a, an object to cut paper, a paper cutter. And this is what I see too. And then we moved on. Uh, with this fish shape, again, for Alessi, and then one with a snake shape. And then Alberto Alessi uh, asked me, okay, stop it with animal shapes. And these are 
an example of it. So again, uh, using archetypes, uh, I had to make a stopper for uh, uh, bottles of wine. You know those, you know, uh, covers uh, to keep the pressure of wine. So how can you uh, design a stopper like that? So once again. Here it is. Here's our champagne bottle. And then you can put a stopper with a hand shape or a maybe a grape shaped stopper and you can do everything actually these things exist in nature and exist in design too maybe some designers already did this but I don't care so if I have to design a stopper for the champagne bottle I can draw inspiration from uh, a cork so actually it's very interesting so the beginning the starting point it's a cork Cover, and then, because of the pressure on the bottle and the fact that it's kept, it's hauled very rigidly from a small iron cage, let's call it that way, that stopper becomes uh, miraculously, actually it's not a miracle, it's a matter of physics, it becomes that stopper. And that shape, I like it very much, because no one designed it. So I thought of uh, designing a stopper like that so that everyone can understand that its purpose, its function. I don't have to explain, okay, the hand shape, the grape shape, uh, uh, and so on. I don't have to explain anything. This was dedicated to wine in general, and this is a clip to cut uh, the stopper that uh, holds the bottle pressure. So once again, the shape is the shape of the bottle. Or maybe this one. This is uh, the drop saver ring, and it's called the ring indeed. So once again, these objects are put on the neck of the bottle, of the red wine bottle, to keep the, the drops uh, that otherwise would uh, get the table dirty. So how can you design it? Uh, it's a ring, so let's draw a ring. It's a sort of a, a wedding ring or engagement ring. Another archetype, archetypic shape, can be suggested by an industrial shape like a biscuit, for example. So this plasmon biscuit is very famous in Italy for children. It's famous because it's really tasty. And I also think that it's famous, it's very widespread and popular for all Italian families because it's also, the shape is a plaster shape. It's a very simple shape. And it's also nice because it's simple because it's straightforward. So I thought of designing for children growing up uh, a skater like that uh, with a plasma shape. So now let's come to the, are you tired? Let's come to the third obsession of mine that has to do with invention in general. So sometimes uh, when designing, uh, uh, when developing designing projects, uh, it can happen and when it happens, it's a great thing. It can happen that you can come up with industrial invention, inventions. So you design a shape, you give a content to your idea, to your concept, and when developing it, and that's the best thing, you do a patent. And that's an obsession. I'm obsessed with inventions because they actually, they are driving forces for the whole world. So no one did it before you did it, and this is a, something, a gift to the world, the invention, the patent. So these are some of the examples of patented uh, um, objects, uh, also in the history of design in general, by great designers, for example, Bruno Munari, who made this monkey. This is a kid's toy. Of course, the invention is not uh, uh, the monkey, but inside this monkey uh, that is made in a soft material, we, um, it was added uh, an iron wire that allowed uh, the uh, arms and legs of the monkey to be uh, folded. So actually, I think you've all played with toys when you were children, and that was an invention for children, uh, dedicated to children by Munari. This object was patented, uh, uh, and from my personal experience, uh, this object really means a lot. It means a lot because it has a great value for me and for my... Uh, it's the symbol of the friendship with Matteo Ragni, with which I made this object. 
So it's a, we developed this project together a long time ago. It has uh, an innovation inside uh, because uh, before we made this object, uh, there was nothing like that, nothing so harmonic. Uh, that's an object that uh, has the function of a spoon and a fork at the same time. Here, there's another innovation applied to the world of lamps. So once again, a Foscarini lamp. So the movement of this lamp is very soft and curved one to direct the spotlight. It's not given by a mechanic piece, a mechanic system, by, but a, ma a magnetic piece. So that is a magnetic uh, sphere. So using a sphere like that for that purpose allows you to uh, create a very soft, uh, a very soft object uh, and very seamless. Uh. So we like dealing with objects uh, that have a good feeling with us, uh, that sound good, uh, that we establish a feeling with, uh, and uh, very sweet, very soft. So this lamp allows this soft and sweet movement. And there's this, how can I say, this ribbed uh, structure, this texture that allows uh, to put up and down the light. Uh, so it's a texture, it's a structure, it's very widespread in the mechanics in general, applied to the world of illumination, of uh, lighting in general. This is a very important project because thanks to this project I was able to become a designer actually, because it was sold in mm, a high number of examples. It was made with Bialetti, that is famous in the world for the uh, coffee machine, for the mocha. So Bialetti asked me to make an object in the world of uh, pants uh, as important as mocha in the world of coffee. So that was a really important challenge for me. So I asked myself, what is the purpose? What is the project's goal? The project's goal for an object like that was saving space. So usually these we all have an experience uh, of this type of object, so we use them every day. So you've got a body like that, uh, and then an object uh, that really occupies a lot of space. So the project was focused on uh, creating a foldable handle, uh, created by two parts uh, that can be folded uh, on both sides of, these, of the main body of the object. Uh, so to favor the movement, the soft movement of the handle. And it's really space saving. So people that would buy this object uh, really understood the added value of this object. So it was uh, sold a lot and it was also patented. This object too, you can see it very big, but actually it's very small. It's uh, as big as a credit card. And uh, uh, you can have a small uh, table set with a spoon, fork, and uh, knife. I designed many uh, cutlery uh, objects uh, in all materials, plastic, wood. I'm not going to show you them all, but this is a very interesting theme to me, cutlery in general, because we deal with these objects every day. They are everyday objects. Uh, so. Uh, and we have to establish a feeling, a deep feeling with these objects. So of course, it's clear that it's very uh, satisfying for me to design these kind of objects that are part of everyday life. So we sold many of these, of those objects. Actually, we sold just nine of these uh, sunglasses, of these glasses. So it's a real number, but it was also patented because uh, it has, uh, in a way, uh, it does have a pathway so these glasses combined the sun uh, lenses uh, and uh, the side lenses. So you, for example, you go through a gallery uh, or a tunnel and uh, you can have both uh, uh, two types of glasses in one. So I call it the quattrocchi for eyes. Uh, that is a negative, it has a negative acceptation, this term in Italy, because it refers to uh, little kids uh, wearing uh, glasses. Uh, so I'm very proud of being a quattrocchi for eyes, uh, and that's why I designed this object. So this product is very recent because it was presented at the Salone del Mobile. There's also an innovation, an industrial innovation in a way, that is actually more an uh, innovation in the usage of this object. As you might know, so to refer to this category of objects, so we 
refer to them as furniture. Actually, we call it mobile in Italian. Mobile has a twofold meaning, an ambiguous, because mobile means mobile, so that can be removed. Or maybe also a table or a chair. Actually, a sofa like that, sir, it's not, it cannot be moved anywhere, it's very still. So, I don't have a very uh, big house, for example, but I want a sofa like that. And what happens in that case? It happens that I invite a friend of mine uh, to have dinner with me, and uh, we sit on the sofa to chat. And how can we chat with a friend? Uh, do we have to chat like that or like that? It's not very comfortable, actually. So I felt that maybe if you just had one sofa in a house, it would be nice to make a movable uh, sofa so that it can be split up in two parts that become two armchairs. So that two people chatting that are not lovers can chat freely and in a comfortable way. So this is a very interesting insight that I had. Because when you design, when I design, you have to think of the people that will be using your things, your objects, and think also of the dynamics of the relationships and feelings with these objects, of course. Between two strangers, we don't have a proximity, of course. So, for example, if you design an object for a family or to foster an encounter, for me, a sofa is something that needs to foster an encounter between people. So people that have to chat very comfortably. This code is called uh, uh, Sami. So this is an innovative uh, input, uh, regardless of the material, the shape. Uh, so they are very important things indeed, but they are not the focus of this product. Uh, they are not the main purpose. Uh, in my opinion, you need to also introduce this type of innovations uh, in your uh, design projects. So. Another obsession that I have is with self-narrative objects that have that bear a message, let's say. Because we cannot only use words to express our feelings and our thoughts. Also, an object can be a bearer of an idea, of a concept, of a message, of a political thought. These are some examples of objects that have these uh, purpose and this strength. These are by Intomari that for me best expresses this type of characteristics of these products. So the shape is not important. What is important here is the expression that you give, the purpose that you give to this object. So we've been talking a lot about self-production nowadays, uh, but actually Intomari was the one who invented self-production in the 60s, self-production was based on these objects. So, he didn't care about uh, the distribution of furniture and business in general, or the shape of things. What he was interested in is, so he just said, take some pieces of wood and build your furniture. Build yourself your furniture. Breaking with the rules of the industrial design and distribution, mass distribution of design objects, it's an utopian. Uh, product, of course, but the strength of the message that it conveys is uh, very, very important, very, uh, it's amazing. So you are the makers of your own life uh, and uh, your own furniture, and that's the message uh, behind uh, also these uh, uh, tray that is really, really heavy because it's made of iron, uh, but there's also the work of men, of workers, uh, the industrial force uh, of uh, the uh, workers' force, of the labor first. So these were objects, uh, these were uh, symbolical objects of a way, of a specific way of thinking. So now I'm going to talk to you about uh, some objects uh, that in my, opinion, in my opinion have this meaning. So this is a nice shaping, a nice shaper, let's say. We all have it in the fridge, in the freezer actually. So this object uh, was designed uh, uh, in the year for the defense of water as a global value. I think you all know that, you're all aware that water for many of us on our planet is a precious value, as precious as gold. It has to do with life, of course. So I made some pieces, ice pieces, you can see it here. So an ice shaper that does not make any cubes, but small pieces with the gold, the word gold written on it. So it's a very direct message. Of course, there's some irony, so there's an ironic approach. This is a 
lemon squeezer that represents Piazza San Pietro in Rome. And if you look at the Michelangelo uh, project uh, with the eyes of a kid, uh, actually the dome is nothing but uh, a squeezer, an orange squeezer. So if you think of a, squeever, a squeezer and if you think of uh, this cathedral, uh, you'll identify the same shapes actually. So how can I say, there was a formal uh, proximity between these two objects. Uh, of course, uh, this object was in a smaller scale, and uh, the name was uh, St. Peter's Cathedral, and it was also called uh, 8 per uh, thousand, auto per mille, that is a uh, tax that has to do with the uh, squeezing of lemons. This is a, an object that has a political meaning. Uh, actually, it made me think a lot. Uh, I heard a news at that time, that was a few years ago, in which IKEA had renounced uh, selling uh, their Christmas decorations, uh, something like, uh, not strictly religious decorations, but even the Christmas trees and Christmas decorations in the countries where these traditions uh, could be considered an offence. So behind this political position, political thought, politically correct thought, I found something insidious because uh, um, sticking to the habits of countries in which you sell your goods, uh, denying your heritage, your culture, your tradition, that can also be a non-religious culture, there's nothing wrong. Actually, it made me think a lot. This event made me think a lot. So, so actually, I think we cannot deny our culture and we cannot adequate ourselves to the market of demand so, so much. So um, I decided to be a little bit uh, provocative and uh, to uh, design this object uh, with a crucifix, the cross shape. Uh, so you can see it disassembled uh, with a... So you have Henry instead of the IKEA word, uh, that sounds more or less the same. So actually, there's none, not something like that does not exist in any IKEA collections, so, so they didn't accept this project. In fact. This is another project uh, that I made. There was an idea for a souvenir that I had, that I came up with, for real souvenirs. You know that souvenirs uh, tell about wonderful situations, uh, wonderful things happening, perfect situations, uh, the crystal sphere with snow coming down, and the dome, uh, the cathedral, uh, the gondola of Venice. So they talk about an unreal world, a perfect world that is not real, actually, because they, in a way, they have to polish and make real life perfect, when in fact it's not perfect. For example, Milan is a city with many mosquitoes and flies. So my Milan souvenir, creating the mesh, the air net, this is a plastic object. And instead of creating an orthogonal mesh, we made a Milan plan. And I think a fly, if it has to die, it prefers dying in Via Monte Napoleone, of course. So this object was also created for an exhibition. There was just a single example for a company producing uh, world globes. And uh, what's special with this object? Uh, first of all, it's a confession of my ignorance. Uh, because at that time, I read of something that I was really impressed of. Uh, and uh, it said that the universe has no orientation. Maybe something that you take for granted. It was not obvious for me at that time, because in my opinion, there's no north, no south, no west, no east. Actually. They decided uh, at the beginning of the uh, 1600s uh, that the north was on top and the south was at the bottom. But that's a convention, that's a standard rule. It's a pure intellectual uh, rule, actually, that created very uh, serious problems. Because if you think of it, from that moment onwards, the south of the world was smashed by the north. And when we talk about geographic maps, uh, of uh, the political situations of uh, the southern countries, of the southern part of the world, we look at reed countries, uh, northern Europe, 
and America. But we have a very abstract uh, and imprecise uh, idea of uh, the southern countries, uh, of the southern part of the world. So since I wanted to stress this idea, I decided to design this object uh, in a very precise way because there's the inclination axis. Uh, if you put it on a flat surface, uh, so this is 90 degrees, yeah, here it is, you need a bending surface, that is a mirror. So you have a mirror here, and in this mirror, actually, uh, you read the names of the countries in the precise way, in the correct way, because in that part uh, of the object, uh, names are written upside down. So with this mirror, you read the names of the countries of the southern part of the world in the correct way. A project can also be expressed in very few seconds and uh, can be an engaging uh, event uh, starting maybe from a drawing and a drawing for me is a starting point also for a political project so I designed, uh, I uh, drew actually this flag on the iPad when I heard for the first time uh, the news about the Japanese tsunami because I got many Japanese friends uh, so I, were, I was very sad about that so this is a synthesis, this is a symbol. Politics for me, if we were to find a word to define politics, is a combination of needs, desires and thoughts. This is a poetic synthesis of an embrace to those people. As you can see, I replaced the red part of the Italian flag with the rising sun, the Japanese rising sun. Many of you maybe don't know him, but Bruno Vespa is a very bad journalist, Italian journalist in my opinion, that uh, has written many, many books. So to communicate my uh, disgrace, my uh, unsatisfaction with this uh, occupation as a journalist, I made a table uh, that uh, used his books uh, uh, for their real purpose, uh, just pieces of paper. You know, the book is a part of wood, because paper comes from wood, of course. So I actually took back uh, the Vespa books to the original value. They're just, they're nothing but wood to me. The fifth obsession of mine is an obsession with a democratic project. I can't actually sleep at night because of this obsession, because many times we design for an elite, for very few people for a niche market, for a number of reasons, uh, because uh, designers and design companies uh, uh, give a value to things. I don't want to get into it, actually, but uh, that's the thing, that's the question. A design object, so if I ask my mother, what about the design object? She would tell me it's a really expensive object, because the word design is often linked to the word luxury. Design is luxury, and this is not good. Design was invented to bring uh, beauty to everyone, to make it affordable for everyone. And that's actually the opposite nowadays. So I'll get back to IKEA now. There are situations in which uh, you can catch this thing where product, design projects are really democratic, so made for everyone. And IKEA has this type of uh, idea of purpose, so the big pen or the insumari. Uh, mm projects that, that you can see there. So a year ago, with some Italian designers, uh, I went to Coop, uh, that's an Italian chain of uh, supermarkets, uh, a huge distribution uh, chain of uh, supermarkets, the most important one in Italy, and I told them, you should start dealing with design and distributing good design objects, uh, designed by Italian designers, uh, respecting uh, workers, respecting uh, human rights, uh, and they should be nice uh, objects uh, and functional objects. So we had a collaboration, a partnership with COP, uh, and these objects were really successful uh, because they were very cheap, they were very cheap. So that was a democratic project uh, because uh, we were able to keep the prices very low. That was my project for a small clip for uh, hanging uh, wet clothes. Uh. It was a monomateric uh, clip so you would buy these rows and then detach all the 12 pieces composing this object to hang your clothes.
Another project that is very democratic and is made by everyone is the Moleskine project. I think you know very well Moleskine. They decided to uh, make objects uh, that could represent the world of uh, writing and reading and traveling, so bags. And they commissioned me to design all of these objects. And I was really happy with the, being involved uh, in designing a pen that costs 10 euros. I would be happier actually if it had cost five euros only, but Moleskine really represents a huge market. So, I was generously talking about this uh, object before. At the moment, uh, this is the object that uh, I produced uh, in the highest quantity, because these small spoons are made, uh, the number is more or less five million of objects a year, so it's a organic and eco-friendly classic for Rom. And this project was a huge design project because the matter B costs a lot as a material, as an organic material, so we used very small quantities of this material, but you also need to consider that these spoons are used for serving ice cream or other cold desserts. So this, for me, was a real industrial project. And even biscuits, as you can see, my position in the design world is that of actually having no difficulties in surfing through different types of experiences and experiments. Many designers, uh, Italian designers, only focus on lighting and furniture. They are important indeed, they are essential fields, but all the world surrounding us needs us and needs everyday objects. Uh, for example, design projects for drain, drains, so, so everything that uh, is damaged or doesn't work properly and needs to be designed by us. So this small uh, cardboard spoon was made uh, for Ferrero and they loved it immediately. I was showing it to uh, Ferrero uh, CEO and they really loved it. So it's made with cardboard as I said and it becomes uh, a disposable spoon for Nutella. Now, I will finish telling you about this story, this last obsession. For me, it's very important also uh, the dimension of feelings and art. And uh, I really love uh, to work, uh, I'm an artisan actually, and I really love the craftsmanship world. I had, as I told you already, I had no design background, not strictly related background. But my education was this one. I was an artisan. That was my education, that was my background. I used to be a turner. So it's a, it works perfectly, actually. This machine works perfectly. So I used to work with an artisan that was my father, but my father didn't want to teach me anything because he didn't want me to follow his path. Uh, but I wanted to learn, actually. I was longing to learn. So, looking at other people's work, sir, so you don't have to imitate anyone actually. You don't have to work as artisans. Sir. You're not artisans. Sir. We have to do something different. We are designers. But as designers, we need to understand the value, the great value of uh, uh, handmade objects uh, and artisans. Sir. We need to understand the value of this work and of the process. So, you have to be good at your work, just like they are good at what they do. So this is the beginning of a workshop. There are some designers, Carlo Contini and others, around me. And uh, I worked with this blacksmith, this very good blacksmith that comes from the province of Como. And I wanted to, so at the beginning of this work, I involved many designers that would make uh, cast iron pieces. I wanted our design work to involve us one day in the blacksmith uh, workshop, uh, trying to do what they were doing. It was a disaster because artisans and blacksmiths, actually, they, it's a natural uh, work for them, so they do it perfectly. We tried and it was a disaster. We were very bad at that. So I just wanted my colleagues to experiment, to experience uh, uh, the work of others, understanding and observing and looking at it very deeply. 
So what happened then? From the encounter between an artisan and a designer, the artisan will no longer be the same person and we will not be the same designers anymore because the artisans want challenges and designers understand how to put these works, these ideas into practice, going beyond the limits. For example, in this case, uh, this very sophisticated object, but also very simple objects uh, with these uh, uh, curved uh, iron piece that creates the object, uh, that it turns over itself. So this is a, this was made in Sardinia with another collaborator of mine, but I want to go beyond that. So I will just uh, focus on this object. So the shapes of artisans are sometimes very folklore uh, objects uh, because uh, Actually, so I went to Sardinia and uh, they told me the knife was always made like that, and like this and like that. So sometimes these traditions, this heritage uh, dies uh, and disappears because they have nothing to do with our contemporary world and lifestyle. So the interesting thing for you as designers uh, is to look at the traditional shape of an object and then the update uh, of uh, the upgrade of this object. So these knives uh, used to be in the pockets uh, of farmers. Uh, and so this is a knife for a kitchen. This is a huge project I made for the Vecchi, so a complete set for the table. And uh, the first work was uh, based on studying the shapes of all the objects uh, that create this table set and uh, create this landscape of a table set and using the shapes uh, to create the prototypes, to make the prototypes. So it's very important to me to make prototypes because you immediately have a formal relationship, a balance, a harmony, if any. So this is very important, working with prototypes, uh, with original shapes. So establishing uh, when something is good or bad. You can do it only in one way, by comparing two things uh, so that you immediately understand this works uh, perfectly, this doesn't work very well. It's a matter of balance, of harmony, but that is the tip uh, for looking for beauty and finding beauty in design objects. Uh, this is from the previous collection. That was a collection. And then uh, it was changed uh, into a, a silver object. So now I'm going to tell you about uh, this uh, uh, project uh, in Tarno Italiano, that is a brand that was established three years ago. And uh, first of all, it's a network of artisans. Uh, Italy is a great country because uh, there are artisans uh, that for every material express the best uh, out of them. Ceramic, uh, wood, uh, sometimes in specific districts and geographic areas, uh, sometimes you see um, people may be working in the outskirts of Milan on ceramics or glass, uh, maybe even near my, my city. There are more and more artisans, uh, very good artisans, that uh, experiment uh, and try and test themselves. There are districts, uh, Brianza for furniture, Venice for glass, uh, Tuscany for marbles, and so on. So what's new, what's special in this product? Uh, so designers have always collaborated with artisans. Uh, so company involve good artisans uh, in their projects. Uh, but my will was telling the story of these artisans, who they are, what they do, what's their story. So this factory network relies on the skills of these artisans so that work to make these pieces. So I really like talking about their story, telling their story, not my story, because that's the novelty, that's the innovation. Because actually a project is not only the result of a concept of the designer, it's also a result of a deep collaboration between designers and artisans. So a project has a mom and a dad, an artisan and a designer. So it has a family. So it's very important to recognize uh, these, to acknowledge uh, this essential value, essential role of artisans uh, in design project. And then I'll just finish with this uh, project that is a story within a story. So a summer of a few years ago, 2008, uh, I decided to design a line of useless knives. Uh, so I really care about this word, useless. Uh, it seems a negative word for us uh, because we always need to find the functional aspect of everything, in everything. So what is it for, we ask ourselves. 
So I asked myself, if we keep asking, uh, what is this object for? This means that we no longer give a value to a poem or a music or a song. What is a song for? It's good for our spirit, for our soul, actually. For some people, it's useless. Or a poem is useless for some people. There's no need to, make, to write a poem for someone. So I really wanted to design uh, a, some useless knives. Uh, because if you go to a store, uh, a cutlery store, they will tell you, this is for fish, this is for meat, this is for bread, this is to spread butter, this is to, uh, for the tenderloin. So a hundred knives uh, that have a specific function. So what I said, what I decided to do is uh, to draw and to design useless knives. And that was a collection that I made. So I had an exhibition showing this object. Uh, and I asked people to tell me what these objects were for. And they told me, okay, this is to cut eggs. This is to cut kangaroo meat. They were invented uh, purposes and functions. They were very funny, actually. But the conclusion of this story, the end of the story is that one day a knife producer came to my studio and saw this uh, wood shapes and decided to create the useless knives. Okay, and this was, I want to finish. I hope you didn't get bored uh, with my uh, explanations. Thank you, and uh, feel free to ask me anything you want. Thank you. So, guys, silence please. It's not over. Thanks. We really have to thank Julia Yoketi. Are there any questions, sir? Are you curious about th something? You want to ask something? So if she asks the question in English, she will help me help me understand better. Because Thank you for your question, that's a very interesting question. So, starting a project for me, it's starting a trip, starting a journey. The first thing I do is free my mind completely, set it free, and start looking at things in a different way, from a different perspective. Because for me, the world really needs new ideas. And I'm playing an essential role in that, and that's wonderful. So uh, people, human beings, animals, and plants, uh, we get older, naturally, of course, that's part of our nature. Objects get old, the way something new replaces them. So it's very important to make things get old. So I'm really part of this role of making objects get old. So you're asking me how I start designing my objects. So I free my mind and I think of the purpose, of the function, of the objective that I want to achieve in designing something new. So finding a meaning in my, in my work, that's very important. So when someone says, we need a new chair, I usually say, okay, this chair 
needs to represent a new hope, a new desire. Otherwise, it's just a matter of uh, duplicating objects. So that's how I start designing. Of course, the design process. Uh, so we work a lot, we work hard, and then we have to remove uh, rendering things. Michelangelo used to say that his work of the company are not linked to a state of mind or a feeling. They are based on practical uh, issues and technical uh, issues or marketing issues. So the project is the result of a compromise or a balance uh, between the company and the designer. That's uh, an industrial project. Otherwise, you are an artist. You are an artist, uh, you make something that is perfect as it is, uh, with no changes to be made. Actually, design has to do with the dialogue. If we chat, uh, after an hour, we'll no longer be the same person. So, so you take something from me, and I'll take something from you. So the project is based on a dialogue, on an interaction. It's going to ask in Italian. Speak Italian. I just wanted to ask you a question about one a session that I have that is the name of the product. Because very often you make a product that is uh, successful, but if it's uh, a bad name, maybe the name will be um, what will damage the product. So, what is your suggestion in naming design objects? Well, um, I think maybe what you're saying, and also Ali says, makes sense. For me, it's just a matter of fun. I don't give so much value to a name of an object. It's not important to me. Because when an object is successful, maybe we re remember it for its name. But if an object is not successful because of the name, actually, so we remember many objects that have become very successful, commercially successful, so we remember their names. But if I tell you Toyo, you think it's a good name? Toyo is the name of a lamp by Castiglioni. I don't think that lamp became famous because of the name. Of course not. I don't think they sold many because of the name. So we remember the name of the object and the reason why it was successful. But it would have been successful even if the name was Anna Maria. But we have to say that since it's a very frivolous and useless thing, the issue of a name, for me, it's an essential issue. So for Interno Italiano, the product that I was showing you before, I showed you just a small part of it. There are about 40 products uh, for that product. And naming 40 products uh, is quite boring. So actually, we need to name things and give a name to things because projects are everywhere. We cannot think of a project that is just... Uh, seeing the drawing, the sketch of something, or a lamp, or a seat. The project has to do with the person. So when there are people who come to me for interviews, uh, for job interviews, do you think I look at their curriculum or portfolio? For me, portfolios, in a percentage terms, uh, they, they're not so important. They're just a 0 0.2 as a value. So what matters to me is the way these people talk, uh, the way they match their colors or their clothes, uh, their interests uh, in life, uh, their feelings, uh, that maybe uh, are inputs uh, for me. So this is what is interesting for me uh, for uh, designers and not the portfolio or maybe projects uh, done at school. Uh, so I don't care about these things. What I care about is other things. That is why everything is a project. For me, Interno Italiano, 40 products, uh, so how can we do? Interno Italiano, so we talk about uh, a specific part of Italy and way of living in, in Italy. So I set this rule. The name of the object of Interno Italiano must be names of Italian cities of four letters. That was my idea. So I, there are 400 names of small cities and towns in Italy of four, well, four letters. Yesi, Afi, Pero, Nepi, there are many with four letters that are easy to remember and give us the opportunity uh, to browse them, to look at uh, them, like interesting towns like Orte or many others. So they are funny. And at the same time, we, in this way, we suggest people a sort of small trip in a minor Italy. So that was also part of the project, giving names to projects. I 
alcuni designer che ho conosciuto qui sono contro la, il fatto di seguire delle forme prestabilite. Uh, di fatto è una, una posizione anche politica, un'idea molto forte uh, sostenuta da alcuni designer. Ho visto che nel suo lavoro è molto interessato nell'architettura e la ricerca di forme basiche, forme essenziali, forme pulite eh, e molto semplici. Eh, quindi qual è il suo approccio politico, la sua risposta a quei designer che invece, che invece vanno contro la ricerca eh, della forma essenziale? That's very easy to answer this question. I don't care about those kind of projects. That's the answer. As simple as that. So I think our work, I don't want to be too dogmatic, too. Uh, but what I'm interested in is the synthesis. It's something very simple and concise. Simplicity. What matters is simplicity. But to achieve simplicity, we need to go through through a complex way, indeed. Because taking things away, removing, is a sacrifice. But it's the only way for us. So designers who design by adding, adding stuff, are not interesting to me. Quindi io sono un visual designer. Quindi non sono un product designer. Uh, forse la mia domanda risulterà un po' stupida, ma... Quanto è importante un materiale nel, nei suoi progetti di design? Perché molti designers considerano appunto uh, il materiale uh, importante, essenziale. Quindi nel suo lavoro, nel, nei suoi progetti, uh, quanto è importante, quanto pesa decidere il materiale anche per il pubblico, anche, per, uh, anche il costo del materiale, insomma. Quindi fare, prendere queste decisioni in base anche al, al costo del materiale. First of all, I think the fact that you're a visual designer and I am an industrial designer, there's no difference actually. We have the same approach. You have some purposes, some goals to achieve, and you want to achieve these goals with the minimum. And that's what matters, I think. That said, materials. I don't agree with those who have no respect of materials. They want to force the nature and the essence of the material. So a, a seat that would be perfect in iron, they want to make it in glass, or make something in glass that would be perfect in plastic instead, trying to force the nature of material. I don't agree with that. So I think it's a mistake. That approach is a mistake. So what we have to do is to listen to the material and what the material says and tells us. So if you work it, uh, if it has been worked uh, in this way for ages and for centuries, uh, there must be a reason behind that. Because forcing the limits, going beyond the limits of things, it's just something childish, something pointless, and I don't care about that. So when I start my projects, there are companies with specific locations. In Brianza, they make wooden furniture. It's pointless to propose them a project of a glass table or a marble table. So the first thing I do is try and understand uh, why they work with wood or with other materials, the logics behind that, uh, the processes. And then together with the artisan or those working with me, we try to go beyond the limits of the material. Have you ever done this? Can we uh, try this as a new experiment? So that's interesting for me. But the first step is listening to materials uh, and what the story uh, that the story that materials tell, because the materials talk to you, if you're able to listen to them. I just wanted to get back to one of the third concepts, sir, the self-production, to deepen a little bit on that. So besides having this strong and deep relationship with the artisans, what is your view on this concept of self-production? And uh, is it really part of your work, of your everyday work as a designer? I was just saying that lately we we're talking about self-production a lot as if it was a complete innovation. It's not an innovation. Designers have based their work on self-production since a long time ago. 
So designers uh, have always worked with artisans, uh, uh, trying to make things, new things. Sotas has always done it. Even when he had nothing to do, he used to work in the world of ceramics and glass with artisans, uh, going hand in hand with them. Nowadays, it's very important, uh, it's a real gym, actually. It's very important to find a relationship uh, like this, because we strongly need, I think this is also your need, to have your ideas uh, put into practice. And artisans uh, are essential to put your ideas into practice, because in that way, by working with them, you understand the value of your product, of your idea, and if it works, if it's successful or not. So we are more and more facing situations, uh, marginal situations like self-production, that will uh, uh, deal with uh, the majority of people. So there will not be uh, a few companies dealing with a few themes. It will become a very democratic approach of an infinite range of proposals so that uh, of designers so that uh, uh, design that uh, product, that object uh, with that specific function that uh, meets the need of people. If you ask me the relationship that I have with the cell production, I think it occupies 99% of my time. When I develop projects uh, for industrial projects, uh, actually there's always uh, uh, an artisan behind that work. So understanding with artisans the costs uh, and uh, the feasibility of things, I always used to say that uh, with no limits uh, there would be no projects. So when I used to talk with some journalists, uh, uh, unexperienced journalists, uh, they tell me, uh, I would really love to be a designer because you are free to express your creativity, I love your work. Actually, uh, because I am a journalist, and I, I cannot be free to express my creativity. And I used to uh, tell them, but don't you think that you can be creative as well? You have to uh, convey a content, uh, uh, a great content, uh, uh, by using uh, very few words, so you can be creative in that, indeed. So if we make objects occupying uh, a lot of space, but with no content, uh, with no meaning behind, it's pointless. So I think this type of approach is uh, very, very important, and it's very important uh, for me. That's it? Let's go home? All right? No, we are happy with you being so involved. Nel suo portfolio ci sono molte illustri aziende, quindi qual è il suo network di, diciamo, di partner, di, di aziende con cui collabora? What is what is the best way to create a network of companies to create a, a, an important portfolio with the many important firms? You're asking me how to deal with uh, companies and how to find a job in this field? Are you asking me that? Yeah, well, I, I could give you a hundred answers to that, but I think you are the only one who can find the answer to that. I firmly believe that each one of you, you and me and everyone, you need to find your own way to uh, hit the market. Uh, I can tell you maybe, I can give you some tips uh, that are always successful. I don't know, give you some advice. I'll give you an example. You know what is, what really impresses me of people coming to my office, uh, people I start uh, talking with, their need is uh, to start working, of course. They want to work with me, they want to create their portfolio, to start collaborating with designers. But if I ask them, what would you like to design? Who you would like to design with? What would you like to do if you were to decide? So your own decision, what, what kind of car would you like to design? Most people, they have no idea. They can't answer those questions. They never identify the real need, the real desire. That desire must be precise, must have an identity. You're not just designers. You need to tell me something more. I want to design a stool for cartel that is 60 centimeters tall. If that's your objective in life, I will tell you, okay, you can make it because you perfectly spotted and identified your objective, your goal. So it's not just that you randomly uh, 
shoot at someone. You shoot at someone precisely. So you want to hit something in particular. You want to develop and achieve a specific goal. So I think each of you must have their way of expressing and to be credible with others, of course. Sometimes I receive emails saying, Dear Mr. Doctor, my name is, I would like to collaborate with you. And of course, these emails uh, uh, were sent uh, to 100 studios, design studios. The email is the same. I'm just a number for these people. I am nothing but a number. So they were like shooting uh, in the middle. So it's like falling in love with someone and sending a general email to all the girls uh, just to come out with a girl, to, to go out for dinner with a girl. No one in particular. So if I'm falling in love with you, if I want to get to know you, I need to know your interests, your tastes, maybe you love that bookshop, so I find you there, I will bring you there maybe. So this is a way to get closer to your objective. And this is something that works, really works. This is very interesting for me. And the network and the tools that you can use nowadays that are very strong allow you to uh, create uh, immediately a network, but a very fragile one, a very weak one, because everyone uses this network, LinkedIn. It's, it's all shit. So I'll tell you my secret. Of course, I send 200 emails every day and I receive 200 back. But if you really want to hit that company, that um, uh, you have to send uh, a handwritten letter, not an email. Not because I'm an old-fashioned guy, but uh, what you understand uh, of someone sending you, not an email, but a, a written letter, is that, uh, oh, this guy didn't do just copy and paste of the email, of the same email for everyone. Maybe you you write a letter, you buy a stamp, you close the envelope. This is a gesture of love. This is love. And it will not go unnoticed. Okay, so thank you. Thank, we really have to thank Giulio Iacchetti, that whole... A lecture today and also a lesson on his projects sir so thanks again because uh, I think it was very very important for you now we're not gonna pay you twice